exhibition that goes in the library an ongoing series where we try to unravel the mysteries that a uh, book making uh, is all about uh, we talk to writers we talk to illustrators we talk to booksellers we talk to editors and even uh, children about what the whole process of making uh, selling and reading a book is all about and um, today we have with us an absolutely amazing author of these incredible books um serpent secrets game of stars chaos curse and the <laughs> new <laughs> a pediatrician by training who now practices narrative medicine and i think that can be a a, a discussion by itself um we have with us new york times best selling author dr shayantini dasgupta Oh, thank you and, for having me. And I, I just had an out of body experience saying New York Times <laughs> best selling author on a cozy nook talk show. <laughs> you know, I think it's happened once. Only Game of Stars came out and it hit the New York Times best selling list. And I remember the lovely people at Scholastic sent me an email. And at first, I wasn't sure. I thought it was about somebody else and I said oh you know congratulations to my many wonderful colleagues at Scholastic and they said no no we're writing because it's about you you made your times by selling that so wow. to me to me it also feels very unreal <laughs> oh but your books just deserve to be there they are incredible incredible books we oh, love them and 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 I think of those your books are the sort that anybody you know grown ups and children alike have loved are loving so um so i i'll go first i typically like to be the first one to ask a question so i will ask you <laughs> so you grew up in the us right and you were born there but reading your books they are so rooted in all things bengali like that <laughs> like the 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 tangra fish sauce and the bedki scales and you know of course the the rakosh and you know we uh, anita and i have been trained in all things bengali because of sudeshna now so she's yeah because of sudeshna you know i just read uh, sukumar ray's habar jabal law we you know abol tabol we read because of her so reading your book so many of those things and at the back of course you you know acknowledged all of that how did this happen like you're so bengali at the same time you're so american you know with with ragging like i lived in the bay area for so many years and ragging on new jersey turnpike <laughs> yeah. is like the biggest joke right it's it's like what every east coast comedian does so so how did you straddle these two worlds it's brilliant Oh, thank you so much. No, I I did grow up. I grew up in the states. My parents are both from Kolkata. They came first to Ohio, which is in the middle of the U.S. And I grew. I was born there, and I grew up there till I was thirteen. And then I moved to New Jersey, which is why, uh, you know, Kiran Mala in, with her combat boots and kurta is from New Jersey. And I think that in a sense, you know, although she and her combat boots are modeled after my daughter. Um, was now 16 but was about her age when i began the books um you know i i think any immigrant daughter is kind of a universe traveler any immigrant family i'll say is yeah. kind of a universe traveler right we exist in multiple planes at the same time absolutely we're yeah. both you know you can both be very very bengali <laughs> and very very american at the same time and i think that the idea that that somehow contradictory or the idea that that should always be in conflict um i think is a fallacy i think the idea that you can't both be very beloved by your parents and well integrated into the us culture you know that's a fallacy there're many of us who didn't find our backgrounds to be a problem that are very happy with our families that you know except the normal <laughs> you know problems that any 12 year old will have right. with their parents but this idea that somehow immigrant kids are always in cultural conflict i wanted to kind of get rid of yeah. some of that i'm sure that's the case for some yeah. people but it's 
disproportionately represented, I think, in literature. In, mm -hmm. When you have liter literature often, young people's literature from immigrant communities, at least I can only talk about what's published in the US, at least in the US, disproportionately, it's changing now, but over time, disproportionately, the idea has been, oh, immigrant children, particularly immigrants from Asian countries, are always you know, in conflict with their parents and, and somehow our stories must be very tragic and there must be a lot of crying and you know, a lot of mangoes and monsoons for it to be truly so Asian. And like, look, I love monsoon, I love mangoes, but like that wasn't my story. I had a fun and funny and normal upbringing. My parents were doting, you know, like you know, Mala's parents. They were also activists. So this idea that they were somehow going to be politically conservative was not my mm. experience. And so I wanted to write a story full of joy and fun and adventure that spoke to somebody like me, yeah. spoke to somebody like me. And in doing so, I'm realizing the fun thing is in trying to speak or tell a story that 12 year old me wanted and never had, I'm realizing that actually the more specific story you tell, the more yes. universal it becomes. So I have kids with no relationship to South Asia at all who run up to me and say, oh, I love this series. I love the rock coach and I love their drooling and they tell jokes and I love it. And it's been a really great experience. Yeah, we, we love that you at no point have over explained anything or haven't dumbed down anything. You know, it's, it's you've left it to the reader to maybe Google something and find out. Like I actually asked uh, Sudesh, okay, what does this mean or what does that mean? Because I have my Google, you know, <laughs> Bengali Google right here. But, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I think for me, that was my most favorite part of the whole thing was that it was so authentic and, and so American at the same time. And so Bengali, it was lovely. I, I love the idea of authors who, who are bilingual or multilingual, not italicizing, yes, only explaining in context. Yep. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> I love that because, you know, I actually think that young readers particularly are really, they're intellectually agile. They're, you know, adept at using Google and they're also, they're adept at, because young people are still anyway building vocabulary. I think anyway, young readers tend to be really good Absolutely. at picking up from context and understanding, okay, not everything has to be obvious for me right. to get yeah. what it means. I think it's really adults. We adults expect everything <laughs> to be <laughs> laid out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I have a lot of faith in young readers. I think they are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, are. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who wants to go next? I, I'm going to stay yeah. quiet now for some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually uh, going to go next. And, uh, you know, what really struck me, two things really struck me. One was uh, the way you included science, uh, astronomy, and, you know, even other branches like alchemy and stuff like that. That is something which is absolutely wonderful. One of my favorite genres is science fiction. So I enjoyed that bit a lot. I mean, fantasy is also one of my favorites. So this is like the perfect amalgam <laughs> for me. Uh, so, you know, how did you manage that in terms of, you know, being able to so seamlessly put together folklore, which is normally dismissed as, you know, regional stuff or, you know, things like that. And you've been able to put in a very, very contemporary ideas and theories which are being talked about right now um, and you know manage to balance that out that was one question I had and before I forget the other question <laughs> I wanted to ask you this very because it's very close to my heart uh, is like uh, in the books you have uh, Kiran Mala uh, with her adopted parents and you have um, her real parents I mean the birth parent uh, and the thing is, she, uh, the adopted parents figure in a very positive way. You know, most of the uh, children's fiction that we uh, talk about or we read, uh, the adoptive parents normally are like, you know, just 
out there as instruments to reach the birth parents whereas in this you've actually given them uh, a fairly uh, good role in terms of making her connected to uh, you know all these stories which then she figures out she recognizes when she comes across all these characters so these were my two questions i was very curious about how you thought about all this and how you managed to convey it so well i just adored the books <laughs> i just gobbled <laughs> them up <laughs> literally <laughs> as a, a book rakush <laughs> 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 you know because we have the lovely barcode art this is the oh, mm, on the third oh, book okay. so okay. this is the sister of medusa the greek you mm-hmm. know uh, character who's eating this barcode this of course is the rakshasi rani the queen oh yeah of course yeah, 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 and, yeah. On <laughs> and on this one we have of course our original not terribly yeah. bright you know that rakshasi eating the barcode. i really like them um, i really like the yeah <laughs> slightly stupid drug questions i know it's a little odd so it's he's, sad. You know, frightening and a little bit pathetic you know? yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah i love your questions thank you anita i um i also noticed that trend in i'll answer your second one first which is about the adopted parents mm-hmm. i think to your question her adopted parents are her real parents. you know real parents are the people who love you are the people who bring you up are the people who are there when you're sick are the people who right tuck you in at night and make you feel safe and to me privileging somehow genetics or you know birth was actually in contrast to all of my beliefs i really don't you know i didn't want to play into some eugenic kind of belief system of like good blood and bad blood or something like that. Okay. I really believe that you know real parents are those who care for children um whatever that looks like. A real family is those who care for children. And I wanted to privilege love and relationships over genetics somehow. And I do and I, when I started to think about it, I realized that you know that's not something that children's fiction often does often we have this i'm going to find my real parents journey and that journey is about finding your biological parents and therefore then your biological parents determine your superpowers your story arc your plot exactly yeah and i just i just felt like well that's the opposite of everything i believe why should i represent that and i wanted her parents to be um both her real parents her loving parents but i also wanted them to be like regular immigrant people <laughs> and so i was like well, how does how is she a superhero if her parents are kind of these regular immigrants and so i came up with this idea and um i didn't have to struggle with it too long because i knew that I knew that I didn't want to reinforce this idea of genetics over love somehow, right? I didn't want to reinforce kind of nature over nurture. I you know, I wanted to honor all sorts of families. Um, you know, Kiran Malas happens to be a nuclear family with a mom and a dad, you know, raising her, but I wanted to say that it doesn't matter what your family looks like. It doesn't matter if it's your nanny or nana or your next door neighbor or your auntie or your whoever it is raising you. if they love you that's your fault you know that's that's the message i wanted to send um and then with the science so can i make a public service announcement yes please sure, sure. <laughs> anyone reading my books please go look up the physics and don't trust me because i am really untrustworthy when it comes to any of the physics i think i am i'm a doctor i'm a physician by training but that doesn't mean i know anything about any other sciences oh um, truly i don't i get all of my physics knowledge by reading the guardian which is not a physics journal <laughs> so please go look it up yourselves um Albert Einstein cannot reanimate and show up somewhere so you know don't like this is all just out of my head um but I do love I love um space science I like the idea of what's out there and unknowable 
I like, um, and I like the fact that folk tales ask the exact same questions that science asks. Folk tales throughout the ages, I think, have asked really important scientific questions like, who are we? What is our role in the universe? Why are we here, right? Why does the sun rise and set? Why does the moon change shape? And I think that folk tales may come up with slightly different answers, but they're asking the same questions. Mm. And that I find interesting. And so I, I really did not want to, um, particularly as a physician, a doctor who writes, I didn't want to somehow have science and art or you know, kind of physics and folk tales feel like they were opposites. I wanted them you know, to work together because I do think that like stories and science do work together, right? You need to be a good storyteller to communicate science. Stories also ask the same questions that science does. I mean, I think that no. those who would make them opposites are telling us a lie. And so I wanted to, in the tradition of, let's say Madeleine Mengel, who wrote, you know, A Ring of Endless Light, A Wrinkle in Time. I wanted to, you know, combine science and story. But that said, all the <laughs> physics is not necessarily entirely true. It is my, like, limited understanding of black holes and the multiverse. And I think I got some of it right. But please, please, readers, go, go, go look it up yourself. People should read. Yeah. People should read Einstein G. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just love the idea of Einstein G showing up, like <laughs> to give us all advice. But again, that is just my overactive imagination. Oh, it's beautiful! <laughs> it's really it's beautiful. Makes, it makes you think on various levels. I mean. You know, so that, that I think is the beauty of your writing. It just makes you think so much about all sorts of things. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I really, you mentioned, um, you know, Abul Utabul and Hajabar Allah before. And I yeah. think that many children's traditions, but Bengali children's traditions, you know, which is my experience, um, I think have this beautiful tradition of the absurd, and using the absurd to um, critique complicated politics and complicated, you know, colonialism or bureaucracy or patriarchy or what have you, at the same time as, you know, you're doing something very complicated that somebody can read into if they choose to, but you're also just telling a cracking good story. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, well, that, exactly. those are just cracking terrific stories yeah, yeah. and so if you're eight and maybe the critique of you know colonialism <laughs> you're not right there for maybe you're there for the cracking good story but I don't know I also think that even an eight-year-old has a really good sense of what's fair and what's not fair what's good and what's bad and what's just and unjust I think young readers really have a strong sense yes. of justice and so the analysis itself may be something you come back to, but I think the basic idea of, you know, we're poking fun at these institutions that adults take very seriously. <laughs> and in that poking fun, maybe we're revealing some injustice in these institutions. That I, I was, I hope I am successful in doing, but I was really trying to honor and like pay homage to Shukumar Rai or, all, or, or even like Lewis Carroll, right, in English. Yeah, yeah. People who are able to use children's literature to do multiple things at the same time. Yeah, like you, you read them as adults and, and think they're not for children at all. It's almost <laughs> like that. So. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 In fact, um, as a Bengali reading your book, uh, I just picked up your, um, the first one, actually, the, I also must tell you that your third one is still not very easily available in India. The oh. Chaos Curse. Yeah, yeah, it's very... Um... So here, message to Scholastic India. Yes, please tell your publishers <laughs> on a public forum. Please send the Chaos Curse all around India to my wonderful yes. friends here. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I must tell you that we have a... Um, uh, so we have this girl gang uh, who comes to the library uh, who... They all love, they are the ones who are particularly like rabid fans of yours. 
and oh, one among it. them yeah one among them is this girl called anushka and uh, so her mother called a few days back and said that you know and we were talking like pujo this year nothing is going to happen yeah. and you know no point doing anything this that and you know and then her mother said but you know uh, so anushka said that uh, you know that that book she keeps reading she got from the library she said she doesn't want any new clothes she just wants a third book in the series <laughs> for pujo I love it. I, I keep t- I keep telling Scholastic that it's a good like Bugo Pujo or Diwali. I know. Package. I mean, yeah, yeah like, it'll be yeah. perfect. Perfect. You should, you know, please tell your publishers that. <laughs> yeah, they should think more about the Indian kids out here. Yeah, and exactly. uh, like I was saying, like as a Bengali reading your book. Uh, the first one when i picked it up i was like uh, oh my god i mean there is rakhosh and she doesn't even spell it as rakshas she just spells it like goes out and calls it rakhosh and she calls it kokosh and and i love like i've loved uh, bhutar golpur all my life so uh, you know bhuts come up in all my stories and the way i talk to my son and everything so it was such a joy and then finding the gonf chudi uh, the <laughs> reference the mustache and all of that and it was just like completely amazing but i uh, read the game of stars a little later because uh, you know your books are always issued so i could not <laughs> issue them to myself um and uh, so my first question to you is why does rakushi rani have so much of ombol like what is she <laughs> what is the reason for so much of acid reflux <laughs> you know like a person who suffers from ombol i was waiting till the end for an explanation <laughs> what is she eating <laughs> and a cure and a cure <laughs> i i have to say this is that it's the best question i've ever gotten from <laughs> this series Like only a fellow ambul so sufferer will have this. I, I feel like we Bangalis, we have a particular like market on ambul, yeah, <laughs> like, right? Pet con con. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we really do have a like. We have a market on either. We have a market on experiencing digestive issues or just mm. talking about digestive. I feel like yeah. maybe we just. If you're not experiencing, talking. you're talking about it. You're talking about somebody else's digestive issues. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just feel like it's, you know, a good 40% of the discussion I hear at any, you know, Bangali community event yeah. is about, you know, reflux and nausea <laughs> and jelusil and like, why don't they sell jelusil in the U.S. and like what's equivalent and you know there's the my entire and i think as an immigrant daughter my upbringing was you know equal parts you know rovindranath and uh discussions of ombul so i had to <laughs> adequately re- i'm representing my culture you know <laughs> and how would you really <laughs> yeah well, yeah actually you know right now the book that's going to come out the mm-hmm. next book is the rakushi rani the rakushi queens like origin story oh, wow, and so wow. it's force of fire is the mm-hmm. one coming out in may 2021 mm-hmm. the cover just got released you saw that you saw that you on yeah. twitter when you yeah, yeah so mm-hmm. um it's her origin story so i had to think about you know is her digestive issues is it something baseline for her or is it like a character development point and at this point <laughs> it's actually I've actually incorporated it into her characterization. Oh wow! Because, yeah, yeah, because she's somebody who produces fire, and so oh. obviously, oh. if you're producing a lot of fire from your mouth, it's inevitable your digestive system is going <laughs> to. So, so I'm she's on, she's on, <laughs> she's on Prilosec. She's on. And so, in fact, the second book it became like the whole acid became a matter, or this book, not the second book, the. fourth book it became a metaphor because uh the book is about it's kind of her origin story but it's also about a girl figuring out that it's okay to be angry like it's okay to be powerful it's okay to be angry you don't have to limit your strength and so every time she tries to limit it it kind of builds up inside of her and gives her heart burn <laughs> and then when she lets it out it makes her feel better oh. so it became a sort of a metaphor 
That's uh, so a fantastic it's, metaphor. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so it's a bit of the, it's, it's that, it's her origin story mixed with, um, you know, the Indian Revolution with the freedom struggle, um, mixed oh. with a little bit of the Bhasha Andalan, the Bangladesh, you know, mm -hmm. struggle to retain Bengali. So mm -hmm. it's like multiple asynchronous influences um, along with digestive issues. <laughs> oh, can't God, wait to not this wait for, can't wait for this book. <laughs> Sounds like a feast. <laughs> oh, but I amazing. also wanted to. I was also thinking while reading this that I mean, this this whole thing is giving me so much of joy. But uh, what was the reaction of your publisher? And you know, because you published with a mainstream U.S. children's publisher, Scholastic, right? So. Um, so what was like, how did they react to this and what was your publishing experience like? So it was not easy to get these books published. Mm -hmm. Um, I, for multiple reasons. One is that I, you know, didn't know what I was doing. I have a different career. You know, I was trained as a physician. By then I was mostly just teaching. I wasn't seeing patients anymore. I ended up writing the first book for my kids who are now, you know, older, they're 18 and 16, but maybe when they were eight, nine, 10, mm -hmm. I started writing the first one for them. And the reason I did is as an immigrant daughter, I never saw anyone who looked even vaguely like me in a story, in a movie, in a book, anywhere. And although it was better for my kids, they were still reading fantasy and you know, so imagine my 18 year old son was maybe eight. So this is 10 years ago. And he, you know, is a big Percy Jackson, Harry Potter, Artemis Fowl fan. And he loves those stories, but he doesn't see a brown kid, right? He doesn't see anyone who looks like him at all. And so I started writing this, you know, the stories almost piecemeal for the kids at bedtime. And um, so by the time I started to think about publishing it, it was a little bit haphazard because I, didn't know what the process was. So part of the fact that it took seven, eight years to publish these books was me. But part of it was also, uh, you know, I'll be honest, it was the publishing industry then didn't know what to do with me. They said, so this is a funny story, fast paced fantasy story about an immigrant daughter from New Jersey. And I said, you know, yeah, so why don't we love your voice? Why don't you write a story about her cultural conflicts with her parents? And then we'll publish it. And I was like, she doesn't have cultural conflicts mm -hmm. with her parents. Her parents are great. Well, we don't really know it. So I got a lot of rejections. Um, by the time we sold it though, I think that the publishing industry had also changed mm -hmm. and groups like We Need Diverse Books had yeah. come in. There was a lot more awareness of different types types of stories mm -hmm. that immigrant kids didn't just need sad stories about struggle. They want me to fuck like across the, like all kids need all sorts of stories. Yeah. And by the time I sold the Serpent's Secret, we actually ended up after many years of like heartbreak and struggle and thinking like, this is never going to happen. And maybe I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up having a very exciting like six house auction where wow. multiple people were mm. bidding on it. So mm. it became a really exciting thing. Um, I found my beloved um, friend and editor, Abby McCadden, who ended up taking the book, um, who was all on board for all of it. She was like, more burp jokes, more <laughs> silly egg jokes, more banana jokes. Like, she was like, all, you know, all in, all the way. And she was the one who, you know, I. In the beginning, I was tentative. I was like, do you want me to italicize? You know, do you want me to explain? And she was like, well, do you want to italicize and explain? Because it doesn't seem like you do. And I said, no, I don't. And she said, then what does it matter? Like you do what you think is right for your story. And she's been really an amazing champion of making sure that I'm being honest to my story. You know, she's been great, yeah. but it took a long time. It did, that's the truth, you know? Wow. Yeah. In fact, uh, I was, in fact, uh, Radhika Dadi, that's what I was telling you that uh, she must be having a really great editor because yeah. it's just, uh, it's so seamless. And at the same time, you know, the references are all there if you look for them or they're not 
that obscure that you'll never understand what's going on. So it's, uh, I mean, it it just uh, it comes together so nicely. The whole uh, the whole yeah. balancing we've, act. We've had multiple. Uh, private book clubs about your books you know we've just like yeah we've just like sat at the library and when there's a lull we've talked about your books it's it's like we've enjoyed them so much and like sudeshna said it took us a while to get our hands on them because they were they're never in the library then <laughs> literally like it's uh, so that's a good problem though. it's a very good problem so we've had <laughs> you know kids going back and rereading it and then you know and then because they read uh, serpent secret then they go back and read uh, game of stars again and then back to so they've they've done a lot of that and so um i think they're going to be very envious of us when we tell them tomorrow at the library that we you know spoke <laughs> with you <laughs> Well, tell them I love them and to keep reading. And I love oh, that. I yeah. love the idea that you called them a girl gang. The ones who are yeah, in there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, I love it. And, you know, tell them that keep reading because that's, they're the ones. They're going to change the world. And they're going to do it by, you know, by reading and opening up their imaginations. And so yeah. tell them I'm, I'm so grateful to them. Oh, oh, thank you. you. They'll be delighted. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this this little special message for them is going to we're going to tell them watch till the end of the video. You know, we are going to, yeah. <laughs> and they can always write me. You know, through my website, there's a contact. Yeah, um, yeah. Thing. I get the best letters. I get the best letters from readers who say to me things like, "When are you making a movie?" And I'm like, "If only, if only it was in my hands." Um, they'll say, "Can I star in the movie?" Oh, they'll give me wow. plot. They'll give me plot points. They're wonderful. They're just terrific. They tell oh, me about their, you know, their so own you have, They're great. You have fan fiction happening already. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> fan fiction, but I certainly have. We oh, and then they'll come and they'll say, "We were discussing on the discussion board." I don't know where this discussion board is, but apparently, <laughs> Scholastic has this thing called Home Base. So maybe it's there. I'm not sure. It's like a little virtual world for younger people. I don't know. Maybe it's there. But they'll say, we were discussing and we think, you know, Kiran and Neil Komal should, you know, get together. And we think they should. And I'm like, they're, little, they're 12. Leave them alone. <laughs> they'll have like all sorts of opinions. Like, I think. <laughs> but you know your books they i think lend themselves to movie making because uh, it's it's so the pictures in our brain while we're reading it and and the voices you know it's it, it's amazing how even while you're reading you hear these different voices and i think it's brilliant there's so much of action <laughs> yeah there so I, I i i'll just Ha, ha, switch a bit and ask you about your narrative medicine and how oh, I was so. reading up about it because I, I didn't know much about it and how as a storyteller how does it help you when you're working with a patient and trying to get them to tell a story I was just wondering about that while I was reading uh, I mean I think it's story. all connected you know I'm a pediatrician by training okay. I now teach this thing called narrative medicine right and I write for kids. And it's all, all of it's about stories. All of it's about listening to people and listening to people tell their stories. It's about listening to young people who often get so overlooked, I think, in our society or societies um, and really letting them lead the way, letting them tell us what's important to yeah. them. Um, I think it's about thinking about power and stories, thinking about whose voices are marginalized you know, in our societies whose voices are uplifted. Um, and I think that's a conversation going on in India right now and going on in the US deeply right now, whose yeah. voices are marginalized, whose voices are uplifted. Um, and so all of my work has to do with all of those things. Um, and so, you know, for the narrative medicine work, in a simple nutshell, it really is about honoring the fact that we human beings need stories. The stories help us make sense of our lives. They help us move forward in the world. They help us connect to other people, particularly at times of change or struggle like sickness, but also at times of joy. You know, that's how we make sense of what's happening to us. And so narrative medicine is about training 
healthcare people, training um, story listeners, but also storytellers in that act, in that kind of sacred act of storytelling and story listening. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'll just say one last thing about that, which is that um, when I was in practice as a pediatrician, when I would see kids, I would write prescriptions for reading. And it wasn't just me. This is something that is, you know, a well-established practice. You say, read to your kid for 20 minutes a day yeah. or read to your parents. For 20 minutes, and then you give them a book, book um, at their visit that's appropriate for them. And there's a group called Reach Out and Read that makes this possible for yeah. pediatricians to hand out books. And it's because I think we know that stories are good for families, they're good for kids, they're good for literacy, but they're also just good for humanity, you yes. know? And so, um, and so that's, I, you know, so the idea that stories are good medicine or that those of us involved in stories and young people like you all yeah. are actually doing healthcare work, like you're actually making kids healthier, that idea is a big one that drives me. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I, it is, it's so fascinating. I'd never heard of this. I'm sure it happens in an, maybe an unorganized way somewhere in India, but I hadn't, I don't know if it's a, if it's a stream of medicine uh, that's practiced here. So I was, I found it so fascinating. So I had to ask you about it. There are people in Mumbai, there are a couple of people in different parts of the country doing work. Okay. But I think maybe not as um, it's been, not been given as much of a platform, but it's it's growing. It's, it's lots it's of great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's lovely. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You're just such a fascinating, amazing person to uh, even speak. I mean, I can imagine where the books are coming from. <laughs> <laughs> just chatting with you. Seriously. So, so what's uh, happening beyond Kingdom Beyond is the uh, the fourth book is out next year. So the fourth book is out next year. Um, and so are so you thinking that, of life beyond the kingdom beyond or is it going to continue the there? Yeah. Um, so, which of course is a loose, as you know, is a loose translation of, you know, it's not exactly right. <laughs> you know, the translation beyond, but it fits so nicely. I was like, oh, it fits with the space stuff to use the word beyond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're really with that. yeah. But yeah, so there's another book coming out next year, which is the Rakushi Rani story. There may be a couple of things in the works that I can't announce yet because they're mm -hmm. not super public, mm -hmm. but there may be a couple of more things happening in the kingdom beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also thinking about, um, you know, other, um, you know, in the middle of dabbling with like a teenage Indian American Austin, Jane Austen retelling. Um, <laughs> oh. I'm such a fan. I'm oh such my a God. Austin fan. <laughs> you know, we, I, I mean, I, I, we can be best friends. <laughs> you do? I'm oh, such a Jane Austen fan. Same here. <laughs> It's like I'm constantly pushing Jane Austen at the library. I'm like, we can talk about this once you're done. <laughs> it's so, well, I didn't, my mom pushed it on me maybe at 12, like around the same age, 12, 13. And I thought, oh, Pride and Prejudice, what kind of a title is this? And then afterward, I was like, why didn't you tell me it was so good? And she's like, I know. And so it's the book I reread all the time. And I force my children to reread all the time. I'm so sorry, my dog is barking. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, you just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think mostly I think about, you know, writing joyous stories for all kids. I just think that, especially in this world, like joy is really an important thing. And it's where we get our power from. It's where we get our connections from. And I think that for immigrant kids in this country, it's um, kind of a refreshing, like empowering thing to see yourself as the hero, but also just to see yourself engaged in joyous activities. And so even with the Jane Austen retelling, I was thinking, well, it's not fantasy. And if people know me as a fantasy writer, it's different, mm -hmm. but it's also the same. And that I really just want to talk about kids or young folks kind of being funny. And Jane Austen is so funny. Yes. So funny. 
being funny, being witty, being joyous, like being themselves, like being utterly themselves and like nerding out on being themselves, like <laughs> as nerdy and as themselves as possible. So, you know, that's my goal is to- Oh my God, I, I am <laughs> like, please right. start <laughs> writing. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should. We need more stories, not less stories. We need yeah. more stories, yeah. you should. Yeah, no, we can't wait for you to write this one and and to read it. It's it, I mean, just the thought of it is so happy. <laughs> well, tell your readers too at Cozy Nook that I'm always encouraging anybody who reads my books that, you know, yeah. they can do it too. They should be out there writing their stories. So, yeah. you know, have yeah. them send them to me. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I just opening the floodgates. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um we are a little so, bit out of time now i think we yeah. are i can imagine so uh so thank you so much this was beyond anything we had imagined i mean this is just a dream come true truly to uh, have this chat with you you are amazing and we can now really hear Kiran's voice. I mean, you are so, <laughs> it, it, it is amazing. So thank you so much for doing this. And I thank hope- Thank you for having me. And, and, oh, one I thing I forgot, one thing I really wanted to tell was I love the covers of all the books. So yeah, uh, they, you know, they, they are just like so uh, full of action, but they've got all that thing right about the serpent and the girl and the, the second one, yeah. the pink. Sarid girls and oh, I know. Gang. they're yeah. so great. So it's Vivian Toe is the mm -hmm. illustrator. Her name is Vivian Toe, and mm -hmm. Elizabeth Parisi is the art director at Scholastic. Okay. And so again, like nobody writes a book by themselves. There, mm -hmm. I have an amazing team who support me: my agent, my editor, the illustrator, um, the marketing team. All of them. They've been team Kiran Mala has been like amazing. So. <laughs> 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 oh that's lovely thank you so much and and thank i you. hope i hope you uh, will visit bangalore and and come see cozy nook i mean i think that that's would it be a happy day if that happens oh i'd love to if I'd and love, when that my happens. next trip I'm, no no my next trip i'll come because i have lots of fam family in bangalore so I'd, oh I'd love to my come. yes what you must <laughs> oh my god that'll be great yeah that'll be lovely so thank you so much Thank and you all yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was such a pleasure. Yeah, it's lovely to meet you all. <laughs> and thank you for sharing my stories with your great leaders. Uh, that's thank the least we can you. do. Bye. 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 Bye.